Happy. 
What I want to do is this. I want to talk about, now listen, I want to talk about something that will help us to group our days into three sections. And these three sections will help us, number one, to analyze where we are right now. Number two, they will help us to understand what the answers are to where we are right now. And number three, they will always draw us closer to our Lord that we might always have strength to deal with whatever comes to play. And, and to set this up, I want you to go to the Gospel of John chapter 2. Gospel of John chapter 2. And the Lord made a statement beginning in verse 19. He said this. He said to them, destroy this temple. And notice what he said. And in three days, I will raise it up. In three days, I will raise it up. The Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it up in three days. Obviously, they missed the point. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, that's really what I'm after, is to get you to believe the scripture and to believe the words that Christ has sent you. Because I promise you, when we finish this lesson, that's the only chance you have to make sense out of this life and out of the troubles and problems of this life. Later on in Matthew chapter 27, when they had nailed our Lord to the cross in verse 39, those who passed by blasphemed him. They wagged their heads and they said, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days. That's not what he said at all. Save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. The chief priest then mocking with the scribes and elders, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Are you hearing this? First of all, he never said what they said he said. But I'll tell you what he did say. He said, there's three days that I'm going to give you. You do your best. You can hurt me. And in, for three days, it's yours. But I'm going to tell you something, when those three days were over with, it was his. And I have learned in my life that those three days represent really some great important sections in my life. You're going to see that the Friday day that he went through was a day of pain and agony and suffering and death. And I'm going to show you that we're going to face that. Number two, you're going to see that the Saturday that he went through was a time of loss, not for him, and grief, and guess what? Confusion. And guess who went through that? Think about it for just a minute. And then Sunday. Sunday is going to be the day that is full of life and joy and celebration and victory. But now what I'm trying to do is to ask you this question. What do I do to get through Friday? What do I do to get through Saturday? What do I do to get through Sunday? Three important days. The first thing, what happened to the Lord on Friday? Well, actually, it began the day before, but really, I suppose the majority of the problems that you face begin. Let's go to John 18 for just a minute. John chapter 18. The Lord said, there's a, there's a powerful section of scriptures from John 13, or sermons, from John 13 all the way to the end of that chapter. So many beautiful sermons. But in John chapter 18, the Bible tells us, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. It was a favorite place for him. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Can you help me? But I always think about that Frankenstein movie where all the villagers were coming up the hill with their, their fire and their lanterns and they're going to kill the monster. And I, guess who the monster is? Well, it's Christ. I mean, that, that's how perverted this thing had gotten. And here they are going up in Jesus. Now watch this. First of all, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Who are you seeking? Wait a minute. He knew all things. 
You know, one of the things that has often saved me from just about losing my mind was I didn't know what was coming the next week. I'm going to tell you something. You lose loved ones. You, you see church troubles. You Suddenly a doctor tells you you're really sick. Had you known about it for two or three weeks before it came, you'd about lost your mind. At least you were saved till that moment that the news broke, you see. But that was not what the Lord was going through. This was a time period that he went through. If you read chapter 19, let's see what he went through. I'm not going to read it all to you. Physically, violence, no sleep, no food, no water, ultimately crucifixion and suffocation on the cross. Did he have a bad day? And then emotionally, what did he go through? Hebrews 12, verse 2 said that for the joy of the cross, he despised what? The shame. You ever been ashamed? I, I worked up a sermon not long back on, on being disgraced. I, I tell you, you probably need to hear it too. You want to know why? This country is aiming to disgrace Christians. And you better know how to handle it when it comes. You better not be tippy toeing around and thinking this can't be happening. This can't be happening because the Bible said it would happen. And now we're living in a time when it's going to happen. I, I know that he went through humiliation. Naked, degraded, shame, rejection, betrayal, all those words slapping me in the face as I read them, but yet the Lord experienced that. And I know that spiritually, what did he go through? Turn one of my favorite books of the Old Testament is Isaiah 53. I love that particular book. I, 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 even more so, one time I was down in Birmingham, Alabama, and, and a good old brother, he said, look, I want you to go with me. I want to go over there. They got some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we're going to go look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they had a copy of Isaiah 53. No, it wasn't the original. It, it, was, it was written about 200 years before Christ. But you know what? That amazed me. That there was a piece of, of literature 200 years before Christ that had almost identically these words in it, prophetically talking about the biography of man that had been born yet. And in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, it tells us he was oppressed, he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before it shear his side, he opened not his mouth, he was taken from prison, from judgment, who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there in deceit found in his mouth. He knew pain. Why did he go through all that? He did that because he was paying a price for what I did. He did that. He took on the flesh and blood of man that he might die and in that death destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and give aid to me. What kind of aid? Just my salvation at the end of it? You say, well, that's enough. No, it's not. I believe in the salvation. But he said, I came to give them life, an abundant life. Do you know what I think that means? Not necessarily was he going to remove the Red Sea from me, but he does part it and help me walk through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because he took the valley away? No, because he walked with me. And there's a lot of my brethren need to learn that again. They need to get their feet back on the ground with that again. He understands pain. He is our pattern. He is our pathway. He is our power. Let me ask you a question. When that Friday came that I can't even give justice to what he went through, I've heard many sermons preached trying to do it, and at the end of it, I'd sit there and think, well, you told me all about the cup and the whipping and the blood and stuff like that. But what is it like to be God with absolute power submitting yourself to madness men when you were in heaven the Bible says God laughed in derision at the men and the nations that gathered up against him and now here you on this earth submitting yourself to these people what kind of control and power must that be you know how did he do it how did he make it through that practice one of the first things that I noted in Scripture was that as that day approached him, the Lord reached out to some people. He reached out first of all to his friends. You have any friends in the church? No, I didn't say did you go to church with people. 
Do you have friends? I was talking to a brother as I rode over tonight, and man, he started he started that same old song and dance I hear all the time. Well, you know, brother, he said, I don't know about this church and that church, and they got clicks all over that church. I said, we got one too. I said, we got a click in Waterview. It's called the church. Did you hear what I just said? It's the whole church. I got friends all over the place. I got brothers and sisters, mamas and daddies, grandmas and grandpas. I'm getting to be the grandpa now, but I've got little dudes that run up to me and hug on my leg. That says one big happy click. You have friends at church. I just think it was so powerful what I, I read about my Lord. And you know, we talked about him going across that, that, that to the brook Kidron and into that garden. Turn to Matthew 26 for just a minute. Let's look at verse 36. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go pray over there. Now this is important, brothers and sisters. He said, I need to go pray. But also it's important. It says he took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. I call this the ministry of presence. I believe with all my heart that my Lord needed this. I think he needed men that he was dying for. We all need friends. We need people that will share the pain with us, people that will pray with us, people that will have presence with us. One day I was at a, at a hospital, and I never would forget this. And I was up there, really for a family member, but there was a lady sitting over next to me, and she had a child in there being operated on. Of course, I, I could see she was just by herself, so I just said, are you all right? And she began to talk to me. And I talked to her, and you know what I found out? Number one, the child was very sick. Number two, her husband had run off with another woman about a week before. And she was up there all by herself. She had nobody. Nobody to hold her hand. Nobody to pray for her. Nobody for her to put her hand on the shoulder and cry. She was all by herself in that situation. And you know, I, I kept thinking about that. And I thought about the Lord. The Lord said, I need you. Peter, even though I told you to get behind me, Satan. James and John, I need you, even though you're the sons of thunder. And I told you, you don't have any idea what spirit you're out. You see, a lot of times we only connect up with a few people that kind of look like us, think like us, and agree with us. Who was that with Jesus? Who was really like Jesus? But he reached out and he said, I need you. And I will tell you what he said. Look at there in verse 38. He bared his soul to them in the middle of that Friday. What did he say to them? He said, my soul, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. He said, I feel like I'm dying. Not tomorrow, right now. Preach sometimes and you feel like you die. You just lost somebody you love with all your heart, and everybody wants you to smile. I feel like I'm dying. You know, here's what we do. How you doing, Ray? I'm fine. I just laughed, you see. I ain't fine. I ain't fine. Did Jesus say he was fine? He admitted, I need help. He had this little group, this little safety. Now, I don't think they were yes men. I don't think they knew what they were talking about most of the time. But I will tell you this. Old Peter would look him right now and say, not so, Lord. You ain't going up there. Well, I wish there had been a time to do some people that had put their foot in front of me and, told, and stopped me from doing some things I've done in the past, even as a preacher. I think maybe that's one reason that I always love Randy McPherson. Let me tell you why. We, we differ on so many things. They're not, not so much doctrinal, but just 
uh, procedural, you know. And he would come to hear me preach. Hated the way I outlined. <coughs> He'd be sitting out there, and I'd, I'd start out, and all of a sudden I'd look back there, and he'd go, That made me so mad I couldn't see stuff. <laughs> one day I sat down and told him, I said, You're going to have to quit that. I said, Have you ever seen a mule eating sawgrass? Because that's exactly what you look like when you're out there. <laughs> you just got to quit it. I said, You want to get me? Get me after it's over with. Don't get me while I'm up there. But you know what? He would stop me when he thought I was going in the wrong direction. Everybody else said, That's a good lesson. I didn't even believe that. You need people that will talk to you. You need people that will be good friends. People that will, will tell you the truth about things. And he went on a little farther. Watch this. He fell on his face. Now, now what does he call that? He said, oh, my father, if it's possible. Wait a minute. Now he's calling on God. Why? Friends are limited. Friends are limited. There's been so many times I wanted to help people and I just didn't understand what was going on. And I, about like these apostles, I'd get tired of trying to help them. Did y'all notice they went to sleep? Did you know what one text says why they went to sleep? They were sorry. Have you ever worried about somebody so much and hated it so much what they were going through? Wore yourself out praying for them, trying to do whatever you could do if you just found them just so tired you couldn't do it. But I will say this. It's better for my friend to come and sit on my couch and sleep than not come at all. And not come back. And he prayed one of the most magnificent prayers because it was a prayer of need. This, this is our Lord expressing a tremendous need before the day of Friday is fully going to come upon him. If you're going to Mark 14, verse 33, it says, When the sixth hour had come, darkness over the land, it talks about how that he began to cry out. And he said, Eli, Eli, I was so back tonight. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. He prayed that prayer right as he died. But he was always praying. When he was in that garden, he, he said something kind of similar, only he wasn't talking about him forsaking him. He said in verse 34 of Mark 14, go over there and read. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther, fell on the ground and prayed if it were possible that the hour might pass. I, I need to stop a minute. I always wondered about that. If he knew everything that was going to happen, right? Didn't I read that to you in John 18? Then why is he now praying that it wouldn't happen? Well, I've done it. Not long back, one of our good brothers in the Lord, Brother Duane Williams, he had COVID and he was dying, literally dying. We knew he was dying. They called me from the hospital and said, I don't know about y'all, but that, where I'm from, they weren't letting anybody in the rooms. But I get a call. Would you come to the hospital? Well, yeah, what's going to happen? They said, he's asking for you. And we're going to let you in there. If you're brave enough to go in there. I'll be there in about 10 minutes. I get up there and they, you should have seen it. They, they swapped me. They put me in all kinds of stuff. They covered me up. They put, I went, I got pictures. And I go in there and there's my brother, Dwayne, and, and he's just fighting for breath. And I just remember as I looked upon him and, and as I talked to him, and I realized I'm so sad for what I'm looking at here, but I said, but I said, take what, Dwayne, the only thing I can do. Let's pray. Let's talk to God about it. You know, the last time I was ever in the presence of my friend, my brother, we both called on God. And when I finished with that prayer, I said to Dwayne, I said, Dwayne, I probably won't get to see you. I didn't lie to Dwayne. I said, I probably won't get to see you now. I said, but I see you when I come to your floor. I said, you just stay, you stay strong in the faith. Hang on. Now look at this. 
He took Peter, James, and John, who began to be troubled, deep in stress. My soul is sorrowful. He went a little farther. He fell on the ground. He prayed, let this hour pass. And I actually prayed, God, let, let Dwayne live. But they'd already told me he wasn't going to. And he said, now watch this. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup <coughs> away from me. But nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. So what was this? Was this a, a useless prayer, redundant in its futility? Was that what this was? I don't think so. I mean, I, I know that God could do anything he wants. I know if God wants to save me, if God wanted to save me another way, he probably could have come up with it. But his will was to save me through who? Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something, folks. Right there in that moment, he was really suffering what he was facing. And he called upon, well, I know he sent an angel, and the angel come down and, and helped him out. But I know what he said. He said, all things. He said, God, your power is absolute. That's the first thing you've got to think when you face troubles. Your power is absolute. Take away. Don't be ashamed to tell God, I don't want this. I know they told me he's dead. I don't want it. I know they told me I got cancer and I'm going to die. I don't want it. There's nothing wrong with telling God I don't want this. Jesus did. Whew. But he said, it's your will. You know what that means? I trust you. It doesn't mean you've already said you will change. That may be so. But what it means is I trust you. I'm in your hands. I know that you can do it. The prayer is over. And guess how it was answered? You say angels. No, angels. And soldiers. <coughs> and false religious teachers. And clubs. And whips. And nails. ever felt like that before? I prayed. And I still had to go through it. Well, they killed him. Okay, he's off the earth. But I want to switch gears. Saturday time. What's that? Oh, it was a terrible day for the disciples. It was a terrible day for the ones that slept. That's, that's most of us, you know that? Would you turn your Bible to Matthew 26 for just a minute? The Lord had warned the disciples in no uncertain terms that when you strike the shepherd, what would the sheep do? He scattered. Well, I've seen it so many times in the church. I've seen it in families. And, and, and even in churches that don't have elders, I've seen it. But you've always had one or two or three really strong people that love the Lord. And, you know, they would stand the ground. They'd stand in the gap. You know what that means, right? You ever stand in the gap when you're hurting cattle? I think it's easy to be the one chewing the cows and whooping at them and yelling at them. I think it's hard to stand there and think that that thing's going to stop. That's the one I don't want to be. I want to be the one with the whip. I've been both. But the day come, and in Matthew 26, the Bible says, in verse 55, in that hour, the, the Lord said to the multitudes, have you come out as a, against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I said, David, with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done, the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then it says a very simple little statement, that all the disciples forsook him and fled. All of them. We can argue about John all you want. I just know what that verse says. In some form or fashion, everybody read. In some form or fashion, there was a desertion. And their condition is expressed in Scripture because there was a mass confusion going on with this group. Matter of fact, I think if you turn to Luke 24, you can see what it is. 
remember the two disciples that were, were walking on the road to Emmaus? And this is after resurrection. And the Bible tells us in verse 17 that the Lord appeared to them. And he said, what kind of conversation is that you have with one another as you walk and you're sad? You're just sad. Well, one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened there in these days? He said to them, What things? And they said to him, Well, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Man, I'll tell you what, they've got this common knowledge, and they know so much about him, and don't even know they're looking at him while they're talking about him. How many of us in the room like that? We know the sound bites, we know the words, we can quote the passages, we know how the sermons are supposed to go. But we don't know if the Lord's with us. How the chief priests, the rulers, delivered him. In verse 21. Oh man, here's, here's the hope of some of the brethren I have made. But we were hoping. We were really hoping. That it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. And and and, and so and the, look here. Oh foolish one, slow heart. Let me tell you something. All the day before and up until that time period there, that was a day of confusion for the disciples. He's gone. You know what I call sad? The what if that. How many times have you ever been with someone that you love and you had your last words with them? You didn't know it. You didn't know that was the last time you'd seen them. And you get the call. And you go sit down and after the shock and the crying and the explosion of your heart, you start thinking, why didn't I say this? Why didn't you come over here? Why didn't they go there? What if we'd have done this? Of course, that's terrible. Don't do that. When something's over, don't do it. All you can do is just tear your heart off. But I think they had a what if thing. I think, man, we should have stopped Judas. We seen him run out. Why didn't, didn't you hear the Lord say, whoever I dip this off and give it to, that's the one that's going to betray me for sure? And I'm sure they saw that. And they were all saying, Lord, is it me? Maybe Peter was thinking, I should have stopped Jesus. I knew he shouldn't go up to Jerusalem. I should have stopped him. I'm ashamed. I've run. I ran. Wait a minute. If they killed him, he's our leader. Maybe I'm next. Oh, by the way, most of them weren't. Just two years later. I think one of the key thoughts here is this, that the Lord had specifically told them, you're going to do stuff like this. Back in Matthew 26, verse 31, the Lord said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Now they should remember that, but, but I want to make an application to that to us. Anybody in this room sinless? Well, not me for sure. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How'd you feel when you were in that sin? How'd you handle it? Well, first of all, I, I, I remember that the Lord said things like that were going to happen in my life. And I don't think he would make such prophecies as that without providing a way for me. And, he, and Paul warned me using some of the thoughts of the Lord. He said, you know, beware when you think you stand, lest you what? Oh. But God has also prepared a way with the temptations that come our way to escape it. And we not, might not be destroyed by those things. And yet I have seen some people, especially preachers, I suppose I'll say that, that would commit a sin and just be totally destroyed for the rest of their life. And the brethren would be glad to help me be that way. That's sad. That's just not the way this is supposed to go. Have you ever wanted to desert God, forsake the church? 
Because God, you didn't get you know, somebody you loved was taken, or there's pain, there's grief, there's disappointment. Have you ever been there? Look, I know there's a God. When Jesus was on the cross, and I read it to you, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did he doubt there was a God when he said that? No. I'll share something with you from my kids. My children have always said, we've always known you loved us, Daddy. But sometimes we didn't have any idea what you were trying to do, and we thought you've lost your mind, and you don't know what's going on, and we're having to ride this out, and, you, and you're going to have to learn the hard way, and you're learning on us. <laughs> but God, that's not the way it is with God. God is perfect in His decision. But you and I, many times, will doubt his wisdom, his time, and his plan. But I'm going to remind you of something. The Lord said, look, you're going to fail. But also, he told Peter later on, when you're converted, when you're restored. And I'll tell you something I've learned in Scripture today. In order to get through life, you have to look for the days of the new life. The Lord made an analogy on that in John 16 when he said in verse 20, Most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament sad times coming for you, but the world will rejoice because they're going to kill Jesus. You will be sorrowful but your sorrow will be turned into joy. And then he gives this illustration. A woman when she's in labor has sorrow because the hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. You see, all the pain is taken away when you see the new life. Oh, this is a very important lesson now. What is it? What if, they? I should have, but I didn't. So what do I do? Live in the guilt of what I didn't do for that person? Or try to build a new life? I made a mistake and I sinned. And now I got to, I got I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna I'm going the whole church is gonna see this. Do I live in the guilt of that sin for the rest of my days, or do I accept the fact I repent? And the brethren prayed for me. Now I've got a new life. I'm a new person. What, what if I waste 30, 40 years never growing or developing and finally I realize at the end of my life I have wasted it. And I repent of that and I straighten up and I try in my last years to really be what God wants. Do I dwell on what I, what I left behind or do I dwell on the days that are coming when I have a new life? That's why he said, unless you become a little children, sometimes you can't fix the past. All you can do is start over. But I tell you, a lot of times we feel so guilty, especially if we get to be the one to start over. What if somebody I love dearly lost their soul? And I probably was part of it because I didn't teach them. But I learned. And I was going to determine for my soul to be saved. I had a friend who was an atheist for the most of his life. And he was converted. When he was converted, about six months after he was converted, he was preaching. And he sent me a, a, a tape from Florida of his first lesson. And that first lesson was entitled, What I Left Behind When I Become a Christian. And he talked about philosophy and lifestyle and so forth, but the last point broke me. He said, my children, I trained my babies to be atheists. And he said, they won't come across it. He said, I did it too good. You ever have a Saturday like that? Can you imagine those disciples on that Saturday. No wonder they went to ground like a little rat pulled up from the legal animals. 
But then, Sunday, it all changes. John 21, John 20, verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary and Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been uh, the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran and came to Simon Peter and said to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, probably John, and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. Peter went out, the other disciple, and they ran together. The other disciple outran Peter. I get outran a lot now, and came to the tomb first. And he stooped down and looked in, saw the linen clothes lying there. He didn't go in. Simon Peter came. This would, this, I hope this would be all of you all. He busted right by him and he said, I'm going in there. And he runs into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there, the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. What happened? The day of joy. He appeared to the women, to the disciples, to Thomas, the meals, the vision. He cooked for them. He appeared to 500 ones. 40 days he walked on the face of the earth. And the Bible said, if all the things that Christ had done had been written, there wouldn't be enough books for us to read to contain that whole story. It's a game changer. It's a reason we're here, am I right? You know what, though, the resurrection does for us? He is alive. He's not here. He's wherever there is. Or there. I mean, right now I'm on this top of the ball, and I look up that way, but there's people down on the other side of the top of the ball. They're looking down that way. Or that way. Or that way. It's not about a spot, is it? It transcends physics. <laughs> but on my Fridays and on my Saturdays, I rely on the presence of my Lord. I remember the promises of my Jesus. And I trust his power. And there's one specific thing he said that really anchors me. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know what that means to me? I don't just talk about it. That's all I can do is talk about it. That's all you can do is talk about it. But Jesus said, I am it. I'm the light. I'm the light. I can resurrect the dead. I can save the man. I can give you a true career. I can anchor a church. I can fix every relationship on this planet if they'll just let me. I was counseling with a young couple. A lot of problems in this particular situation, but I asked two questions. I said, Do you, according to both, love each other? And there had been multiple adulteries and all kinds of indiscretions. And they both said yes. I said, well, you don't act like it. Somebody's got to tell you the truth. This may be the way the world does it, but you don't act like it. I said, secondly, do you love Jesus? Yeah. But you don't act like it. And I said, you want this marriage fixed? I said, you're trying to get me to bring two broken down people wrapped up in the sins of this world and in unbelief and you want me to join you two together I wouldn't do that for anything I would not I said but I'll tell you what I will do when you both come to Christ and through Christ learn what it means to love then I can bring two complete people and then join them into something worth being joined in but I am not going to fix two broken people and just paste them together. I said, the first thing we're going to have to talk about is do you really know what it means to be a Christian? Brothers and sisters, that's part of our problem today. We're trying to fix things without Jesus. And I don't know how we're going to do this. But as I close this lesson, what day is this for you? This day right now. 
Uh, is it did? Go ahead, Jesus. I don't know, have another word. But is this your Friday? And did you have a long Friday today? Or is this your Saturday or what if day for you? But if you're really God's child, I don't care what happened to you today. This is your Sunday. The day he come out, you're remembering the resurrection. This is our power when we think of him. And I think about this. One day everybody's going to rise up again. No, every day I rise up. Again and again and again because he rose that day. When sin and suffering and sadness knock me down, I know I'm going to get out. Maybe not right off the bat. But I'm going to get out. Because he's going to reach down and bring me up. And one day, just like my brother did, Dwayne. Oh, by the way, the only word he had said in days when I answered the prayer, do you know what he did? He took a big, deep, ragged breath. That's where they're here to say. Bury them. So be it. You Christian? Do you know what one is? I'm not a simple preacher to be blessed on what it takes to be a Christian. But I do know this. If you will believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and be baptized as you repent of your sins, you can know what one is. You're a child of God that's been beat up in the life, and maybe you actually kind of slipped away a little bit from him. Well, we all have some, maybe a little bit somewhere. We've all had Saturdays. But let this be your Saturday. What do you really think about this? Let's stand up and say. <laughs> when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word,
really drink in that lesson, it just goes on and on and on. Because we've all had those Fridays, figuratively speaking, where we've dealt with all the difficulties of this life. The mistakes that we've made, those that we've lost, other misfortunes have fallen us, and it just looks like we've hit the bottom and there's no way up. And then we have the Saturday that follows, when we're always trying to rehash it. What could I have done differently? How could it have been handled some other way? Was it my fault? Maybe I should have done this. And we eat ourselves up again, trying to figure out how am I going to get through this? How am I going to survive this? And in many of those situations, those conversations are very I-centered. How am I going to get through this? What am I going to do? How can I handle this? The fact is, as Raymond's shown us tonight, you can't. But everything changes on Sunday night. And with the help of the Lord, whatever the mistakes are, whatever the errors have been, forgiveness is right there. From a father that loves us, allowed his son to die. Wow. There's a lot in that. There was one point, I'm not going to re preach anything about Raymond's lesson, I couldn't come close. But there's one illustration that he mentioned whenever Peter ran into the tomb. And you saw all the grave clothes there that's where they wrapped up the Lord. And then the napkin was folded by itself. I always have wondered why that was there. And then one day I read an article that kind of maybe made some sense to me. Maybe it has a bearing, maybe it doesn't. But whenever you finish a meal and it's over and done with and you're ready to get up and leave, you basically just got to take the napkin and toss it with the other stuff so the people clear it away and you're done. But if the dirt dessert's coming, the best is yet to come. You're not quite finished with things yet. You save that napkin. You might need that thing again. And that napkin being folded was just kind of a way of the Lord discreetly showing as a servant would read the table, well, the napkin's messed up over there, they're done. That's folded. Something else is coming. And so there was. All the things that came through the death and the resurrection of the Lord are blessings that we can count forever. There's just so much to ponder on that. I can chew on that for a long time. But thank you, Raymond. Appreciate so much the, the material that you've given. Appreciate it. And we hope that we'll all be able to benefit from that and be able to come back some more this week as the, the meeting continues on through this, this coming Friday night. Any other announcements we need to make tonight? Anything that, that we may have overlooked? If not, then I suppose Joshua is moving their minds and close them to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for all that you do for us. Thank you for the physical blessings and the spiritual blessings that you give us. You give us so much more than we need and deserve, and pray that we're always thankful for what you do and never take it for granted. We're thankful that we have this time tonight to gather as your children, to hear a message from your word. Help us to always have a desire to seek your will, to seek your word. pray also at this time that you would be with those who are sick, especially those who were mentioned earlier tonight. We pray that you would watch over them and heal them and have their strength return to them at this time. We pray for the church here in the Eubank that it would always stand for the truth and stand for your word. And we pray for congregations of your people all over the world, especially those in countries who face persecution and prison and even death, we pray that you would be with them, give them strength and comfort so that they can endure to the end. And we pray if those things one day happen in our own country, that we also will stand firm and not waver, but always do what is right. And as always, we thank you for your Son, who left the glories of heaven and came to this earth. And 
lived a perfect life and died on the cross, not because of his sin or anything he did wrong, but because of our sin. We thank you that you have the forgiveness of sins through him and also that hope of a home in heaven. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.